think it was those guys and dolls that said you got trouble. You remember that song from that yeah. musical? You got trouble. <laughs> who, who, who among us has never had trouble? You stand up, uh, we would like to applaud you <laughs> and to warn you it's coming. <laughs> we all have difficulties in life, do we not? Yes. Problems come, and the good news is problems go. Praise the Lord. <laughs> the scripture is up there for you to look at uh, as we uh, go through the day, uh, through, through this uh, discussion today. Uh, we've already read Psalm 124, which is part of the background for this by the way, was written at a time when uh, David had uh, basically just seized uh, or ascended to the throne, I guess is the proper way of saying it, of Jerusalem. And the Philistines, who were his mortal enemies, didn't like it. So they decided they were going to go to war with Israel to remove David as uh, the king. And so uh, David asked the Lord if he should attack them. And the Lord said yes. And David said, will you give us victory? And the Lord said yes. So he attacked. And the Lord gave him victory. Then, then there was another uh, uprising of the Philistines. And David asked again, Lord, shall we go out against them? And will you give us victory? And the Lord said, no, this time I don't want you to go out and attack them head on. I want you to go around from behind. And when you, listen, this is really interesting. He said, when you hear the sound of hoofbeats and troops in the trees above you, you will know that my army has gone before you mm. to give you the victory. Wow. And they had a mighty victory that day. And that, that was the background for the song that we read at the very moment. It just gets me uh, goosebumps just uh, thinking about it. Uh, God goes before us, but we need to listen to him. We need to seek him, seek his counsel, follow his instructions. And when we do, he will give us the victory. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but do not be afraid, for I have overcome the world. Jesus has already defeated our three worst enemies, sin on the cross, death when he arose, and hell when he brought the keys to hell with him as he arose. And the Bible says he led, he led captives in his train when he ascended. In other words, there were people in hell that Jesus released and brought with him and took him with him to heaven. And uh, so he's already conquered our three worst enemies, sin, death, and hell. What do we have to be afraid of? Mm. What are we afraid of? What, what, does, uh, when, what are we being inundated with <laughs> if it isn't fear? And being told you have to do this, you have to do that, mm -hmm. you have to do this, yep. you can't do that because of fear. And we are not called to live in fear. We are called to live victoriously. That song that we just sang during the offertory talked about our, our Savior who can move mountains. Mm -hmm. And yep. Karen is wearing a necklace today that has inside of it a little mustard seed. Oh. And it's tiny. It's yes. tiny. Can you see that? It's, it's about that big. Like a flea. It's, yep. it's about the size of a flea. Yeah. And, <laughs> And uh, Jesus said, if you have that much faith, you can say to this mountain, be moved from this place and cast into the sea, and it will be done. Did he mean that physically, literally? I guess if it's needed and God wants it to happen, yeah. But it certainly applies spiritually and uh, symbolically to the various problems that we face in life. And so people face problems, and this is nothing new. In fact, you could say that dealing with problems and dealing with issues and dealing with crises is all part of life. Hmm. It's a never-ending succession of issues. Hmm. And so we're, we're going to, if we're in college, we're going to be facing challenges. We're going to have to learn. We're going to have to take classes. We're going to have to take exams. We're going to have to accomplish objectives if we're in life. If we want to have children, there, there are going to be challenges. There's going to be issues that rise. It's, it's, you know, childbirth is not easy, so I'm told. <laughs> I've, had, uh, I've had a couple of kidney stones, and some have said they'd rather have a child again. <laughs> so uh, I can be a little sympathetic. 
but it, I'm sure it's not the same. But there's, there are crises and there's problems and there are challenges that we all face. And so you can go ahead to that next one, Rocky, as we look through the Bible. And this is just a smattering. This is just a sampling. If you think of it, really most of the Bible, if not all of the Bible, is how God helped people deal with problems. If you think about it. Amen. Think of a character in the Bible that did not have a problem. Hmm. That's the whole point of the Bible is to, is to tell us that our God is able to help us through our problems. And this is just a sampling. Moses had problems. In Numbers chapter 11 we read, the rabble with them. Now this is after they came out of Egypt. After they crossed the Red Sea, they've been wandering around a little bit in the wilderness. They've received the word uh, from the Lord. And God has been providing them manna every day to eat. To keep them alive. And he's provided them water time and time again in various places. <clears throat> and it says, the rabble with them. I, sh I could just build a whole mm. sermon right on that. Yep. This is God's people. But among them were the rabble that we would just like to complain. I've told you before when I was in the military, complaining was almost a, a favorite pastime. We all thought we knew a better way to do things. And, uh, and so complaining became kind of a challenge. Who could complain better? <laughs> uh, and there was a rabble among them that began to crave other food, it says. And I don't know. I'm living in the wilderness, and every day all I have to do is wake up and walk out of my tent and grab up enough food off the ground to eat for the day. And I know that God has provided that. I would like to think, I probably am wrong, but I would like to think that I would be thankful and I would not complain. But there was a rabble among them that complained. And you know what complaining does? It's contagious. It's, it's like a virus. When complaining starts, it kind of gets the ball rolling and other people get caught up in it. It's like a snowball. If you're in the way of it, you're going to get caught up in it. You're going to become part of it if you're not careful. And they complained that if we only had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this man. Mm. Complaining about the food that the Lord has provided free of charge, and ample supply every day. It just blows my mind. I'm sorry. And so Moses heard the people of every family wailing at the entrance to their tent. So it's, this has become a contagion. It's become a virus that has spread throughout the people. And the Lord became exceedingly angry, mm. understandably. And Moses was troubled. Mm. He asked the Lord. Uh, he kind of joined in the complaining on a different key. He says, why have you brought this trouble on your servant, speaking of himself? What have I done to displease you that the, put, you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. For I have, if I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. So Moses got caught up in the complaint, you might say. So Moses had problems. And as we talked about earlier, David, after Moses, had problems with the Philistines. Esther had problems. You remember Esther? Mm -hmm. She was a little slave girl that uh, was chosen to be among the harem that might become the queen under Xerxes. And eventually she was chosen. She was a Hebrew girl. She was an Israelite. She was a Jew. And she was chosen to be the next queen 
of the land, of the, the, the government that had overrun her country and had removed the people from the land. And Haman was uh, an Agagite. Now, an Agagite, he was a descendant of the king that Saul did not kill when God told him to. Let that sink in. And Haman the Agagite hated the Jews. And he had devised a plan. He basically had tricked the king into allowing him and whoever wanted to join him to annihilate the Jews. Because they, the one Jew in particular named Mordecai, did not honor Haman as he thought he should. And so long story short, Esther, the new queen, who happens to be a Jew, God, as, as, Haman, as Mordecai told her, said, God may have put you in this place for just this time, for a time, just a time as this, such a time as this. I love that phrase, I just can't say it. And so <laughs> she takes it upon herself to go to the king unsummoned by the king which was a death penalty offense. To come before the king if he didn't call you was a death penalty. But she took it upon herself to appear before the king and she took her life in her hands by doing so. And essentially she invited the king and Haman, who hated her and her people, to dinner. And so she made dinner for them. And the king says, after the dinner, what would you like? Uh, what, can, what, what do you want from me? What can I give you? And she says, just come back tomorrow night. I want to feed you again. So she, they go through this whole thing again. Hey, uh, Haman and the king show up again for the next feast. And they enjoy that feast. And the king asks her, asks her again, what is it that you want me to do for you? I'll give you anything, up to half of my kingdom. What do you want? And she said, I just, I just want you to spare my life and the life of my people because we have been marked for death, for annihilation. And the king says, who in the world would take such a risk by targeting you and your people? And she said, this guy right here, Haman. She pointed him out. And God helped her through that and gave her the courage to stand before the king and in the end, Haman was impaled upon a pole that he had set up for, guess who? Mordecai. <laughs> who was <laughs> Esther's advisor, his, her uncle, but also her advisor, and who had failed to honor Haman as Haman thought he should. And that established a, a whole new feast of celebration for the Jews, and it's called Purim, Purim, P-U-R-I-M, and it happens in the middle of March every year. And uh, they are to celebrate by feasting and experiencing joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. <laughs> so Esther had problems. God helped her. Jesus' disciples had problems. And one of the problems they had was uh, to be able to identify who the real enemy was among them. They, they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, we saw a man, oh, I'm going to summarize, we saw a man who was casting out demons in your name, but he's not one of us. So we told him to stop. And Jesus said, don't tell him to stop. He said, anyone who's not against us is for us. And then he said, in Mark 9, 42, if anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. Essentially what he's saying is, this man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name, whether he realized it or not, he trusted in Jesus' name. Therefore, he trusted in Jesus. And they were silencing him. And he said, anyone who causes one of these little ones who believe in me, they may not be in the inner circle, but, you know, they believe in me. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, one of the 12. You believe in Jesus. You're for him. He said, anyone who causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble. We tend to think of the little ones as, re as referring to children. It's not just children. It is children. 
It's not just children. It's anyone who believes in him. He says if you cause them to stumble, it would be better to have the large millstone hung around their neck and they to be thrown in the sea. And then he says, if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better to enter life, eternal life, maimed than to go with two hands into hell. Where he says the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die and the fire is not quenched. Mm -hmm. Everyone will be salted with fire. And, and I think that's one way that Jesus is saying everyone will experience trouble. Mm -hmm. Everyone will be salted with fire. So, you know, difficulty seasons us. You've heard of being a seasoned veteran in a sports team. It means you've been there, you've done that, you've crossed the hurdles, you've fought before, you've struggled, you've overcome in times past. You are a seasoned veteran. And difficulty seasons us. Someone said that, that adversity introduces us to ourselves. Mm -hmm. We talked a lot this morning in Sunday school about this last year and all of the, the difficulties and the isolation and everything that happened as a part of this virus that's affected the whole world and, and how difficult it was. But at the same time, all of that difficulty, all of that isolation, everything we've had to deal with, it has introduced us mm -hmm. to ourselves. Amen. Now, there's one who's not here, but who's guilty. And what they discovered about themselves is that they are a quarter of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Jeannie. Poor Jeannie. She can't even defend herself. <laughs> but, you know, some realized as a result of this crisis that they are hoarders of toilet paper and other paper goods. And then others of us realized, you know, how much we need our families, mm -hmm. how much we need our neighbors, yep. how much we need our church. Amen. So Amen. this... This adversity, as difficult as, as it has been, has introduced us to ourselves, to who we really are. Amen. It has salted us. We've been salted with fire. We've been seasoned. We've gone through that. There, for a long time, will not be a generation that hasn't gone through that. I think of the Great Depression. I didn't go through it. My, my parents did. That seasoned and salted that whole generation and it flavored the way they look at everything in mm -hmm. life. Yep. That's why you're reason some people hoard toilet paper, maybe. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't think Jeannie went through that. <laughs> but when we go through difficulties, each generation seems to have some kind of a challenge. I grew up under the, the uh, curse of, or the scare of uh, worldwide annihilation through nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. I grew up in that. Yeah. It's seasoned the way I think and the way I, the way I act and react. Every generation seems to have something. There was a 9-11 generation. A whole generation now, 20 years has passed since 9-11. There's a whole generation who were born after that, who are now coming of age. They weren't alive then. Like if, they were, if they were alive, they weren't aware. So what will season them? Each generation will be salted. But he says if salt loses its saltiness, how can you make it salty again? And he said, have salt among yourselves. In other words, I think what he's saying is allow the difficulties to accomplish their purpose. Mm. Amen. His purpose. It's not easy. But struggle... When we come out of it, it makes us stronger. There's a song, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I guess the opposite is true. <laughs> Thinking what doesn't make you stronger kills you. But, <laughs> but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> whatever your challenge is, whatever your difficulty is, as an individual, or as a, as a family, or, or as a church, or as a generation, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Coming through it makes you stronger. 
Jesus' disciples had problems. Their problem was ident enemy identification. Jesus said, if he's not against us, he's for us. He says, your real enemy is your hand, your foot, your eye, anything that causes you to sin. He said, you'd be better off without any of those things if it will lead you to eternal life. And he says, allow difficulty, allow salt to accomplish its purpose. Now James, his readers, had a problem too. In James chapter 5, 13 and 20, we read, is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Did you hear that? Oh. Is anyone among you? He's writing to Christians. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. In both cases, we are turning our attention to God. Yeah. We're not focusing on the trouble. We're not focusing on the joy or the happiness. We're focusing on God. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith to God, in brackets, will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. How many of us have confessed a sin to another human being in the last week? Okay, good for you if you have. That's what James tells us to do. Confess our sins to one another where we drop the ball. You know, it's okay to say, you know what, I dropped the ball on that. I, I didn't do what I know God wanted me to do. Maybe I didn't know, realize it at the time, but I realize it now, and, and I'm sorry. Would you pray with me that I, I won't be guilty of doing that again? How many of us would love to have a, a leader who could say that? Absolutely. A pastor, Sunday school teacher, church leader, civic leader. To be able to say, admit, I dropped the ball there. Forgive me. Pray for me that I won't do it again. That I'll be better the next time. Elijah, he says, was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Why did Elijah pray that? Because the people were living in sin, and he felt like God needed to get their attention. And so he prayed that the rain would stop so that God could get their attention. And he did. And then later, he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. He says, my brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back. Remember this. Whoever turns the sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover a multitude of sins. So the, the readers of James had all sorts of problems. They had troubles, unnamed troubles. They had to deal with, you know, what do you do when you're happy, when everything's going your way? There's a tendency to kind of get a big head and say, well, you know, God loves me more than he loves that person because look how they're struggling and look how I'm blessed. Mm. 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 Maybe he's blessed you so that you can help them in their struggle. Amen. Amen. But they had problems of all sorts, but in each case, James says, don't focus on the problem or even on the blessing or even on the sickness, but focus on the Lord. Turn to him. Look to him. In prayer and in praise, and he will provide for your needs. Now quickly, we're just going to run through what, uh, what is left here in the, in the demonstration. Moses was overwhelmed. David had come back. David had mortal enemies. Esther and her people were in peril. We talked about these things. Jesus' disciples misunderstood the real threat. James' readers had various problems. And next. God provided... For each need. Moses, God provided 70 men who were called out from among the people, leaders who were known to be leaders by Moses. And God called them to the tent of meeting and God took some of the spirit that was on Moses. That spirit may have been God's power, but it may have also been the, the, the burden that Moses had. And he placed it upon those 70 men. Two men decided not to show up at the tent. God didn't let him off the hook. He, he 
place that blessing on them as well, that spirit upon them, and they prophesied right where they were. And someone came to Moses and said, these two guys, I think it's Bill, I can't remember their name, the dad brothers, uh, Bill Dad and Eldad, somebody else, something like that. They're prophesying in their tents. And Joshua, who was with Moses from the time he was just a young person, said, Moses, tell him to stop. And Moses said, are you nuts? I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> says, are you nuts? He said, I wish everyone Amen. would be filled with the Spirit of the Lord That's right. and would prophesy. That's what God created this, the race to be, was a race to prophets and priests for the whole world. So that every nation would come to know God through them. Moses said, no, I'm not going to tell them to be quiet. I wish everybody was filled with that spirit. David, God gave specific instructions and gave him victory. Esther, God protected her as she worked out her plan. Jesus instructed the disciples as to who their real enemy is. James and readers were offered a solution which is to pray, focus on God. Next. Moses was given help to carry the work of leading God's people. David and his men were given decisive victories by God. Esther, God protected her and her people, and Haman was destroyed. <laughs> Ironically, he was destroyed on some versions call it a gallows, others call it a pole, maybe a cross. But uh, he was destroyed on something that he had erected to be used against Mordecai, his, his mortal enemy as far as he was concerned. God is a God of irony. <laughs> Jesus' disciples were trained to recognize the real enemy, even when it was something that was attached to them. James's readers were given hope and a real solution, which was to rely upon God. Yeah. Next. Moses was relieved, and more people were involved in leading God's people. That's always a good thing. The more people you have doing the Lord's work, one benefit of that is People don't tend to complain when they're the ones doing the work. Hmm. Amen. And so that cuts down on the complaining. And if you're one of the workers and you hear someone complaining, if it's one person, you know, he just kind of has to listen to it. But when there's 70 of them, they might take that person aside and say, you need to be quiet. <laughs> Quit your complaining. Let's get on board mm -hmm. and work together. David was eventually able to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. Mm. Esther and her people were spared and allowed, get this, to plunder the homes of those who attacked them. Jesus' disciples were better able to lead new believers. And James's readers found the hope and the help that they needed. Next slide. So what's your problem? Like that lady says in a commercial, what's in your wallet? <laughs> what is your problem today? God is in the problem solving business. It's what this book is all about. He has helped people through problems and sometimes he uses the problems to help the people. I think of Joseph. I didn't even mention Joseph. Yep. Look at all the problems he had in the Old Testament. Sold by his brothers into slavery. Falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, imprisoned by Potiphar, forgotten by the one person that understood that God could use him until the king had this dream, or Pharaoh had this dream, and, oh yeah, remember this guy Joseph, he could interpret dreams. And he rises to be second in Egypt, only to Pharaoh. Stores up a bunch of food for seven years, and then when the famine hits, his own family, the brothers that sold him into slavery, end up coming to him unknowingly mm -hmm. asking for food. Amen. And the race is spared. Amen. His family is spared. God is in the problem-solving business. Sometimes he solves the problems for us. Sometimes he uses us to solve the problems. Sometimes he uses the problems to solve something in us. Mm -hmm. We need to allow ourselves to be salted. That's that's not that's not fun. That's not what you came to hear, is it? But sometimes we have to allow that to happen. Amen. So that's what school's all about, isn't it? Basically, you face all these challenges, all these issues, all these 
classes you have to learn and all these, these tasks you have to accomplish and it is salting you, it's preparing you for what will come in the future. Once you have that degree, we'll be praying for you. So God is in, a, in the problem solving business and it may involve some risk just as it did for Esther and for all of these individuals that we talked about. But God's solution will do two things. It will help you and it will glorify God. Amen. And that's part of our, the reason that we all exist is to bring honor and glory to Him. So, real simple. Just bring your problem to Him and watch Him work. He may work through you, He may work for you, He may work on you. But let Him work and allow His allow the problems to accomplish their purpose. If you're dealing with an issue, Someone is watching. Someone who may not really know or trust the Lord is watching. I believe one of the reasons that people hate hypocritical would-be believers is that they are really looking for authenticity. They're looking for real, live Christianity Amen. that really works, It really makes a difference. If you're going through a problem, there's a good chance somebody who does not know or trust the Lord is watching you, and they're looking to see if your faith is going to make any difference. So we need to allow the problem to salt us. <laughs> and it may even spill out on them and salt them too. Isn't that great? Would you stand with me as we respond to his word today and let us read together? this response. Heavenly Father, we have heard from you today, and we thank you. Help us now to receive what you have spoken to us, to allow it to permeate our hearts and our souls, to transform us so that we may be better reflections of your image in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us share this benediction with one another with hands held out to receive it. <clears throat> now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. God bless you. Go in peace. Tell everyone that you see you're glad they came to Lakeview today and pray for those who are traveling. And we'll hopefully be back together again soon. God bless you. Have a great week in the Lord.